Um, okay, so I'll get on the way. Uh, in part one, I'll talk about uh, a little bit about finite elements and how we persuade our data into finite element models and the development of Voxa V2. Uh, in part two, Neelifer in uh, Edinburgh will, will take over and discuss the new solver. And then I'll return in part three to discuss uh, how we're approaching remodeling. Uh, okay. So for the first part, how uh, the Vox FE2 GUI plugin uh, is being developed. Uh, well, I, I'm aware that some people may not, not know a great deal about finite element analysis. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what that actually involves and uh, how that informs our choice of data and how we, we go about trying to change that data into a finite element model. And uh, and that feeds into really uh, how we started developing Voxify. It has a bit of history at Hull uh, for a, a decade or so, um, but we have decided really to to rewrite uh, a, a quite a chunk of it uh, in both the GUI and the, the solver parts uh, to take advantage of some some new features of other libraries really. So finite element analysis is a well-proven and even commonplace technique really in, in engineering. Uh, it's also very popular for, for modeling biological systems and many others, of course. Um, and from our perspective, it's used to calculate deformations of an object when subjected to, to various loads. Uh, we use it to predict stresses and strains and how they are distributed in uh, uh, objects under test and the reaction forces uh, where, the, where the object is, is kind of pinned down. Um, in a way, uh, what we're actually trying to do is, is, is treat our objects as a kind of um, a piece of usually very hard rubber, which might seem a very odd thing to say, but, but that's true. And it, and it seems to be to keep fairly true even for, for some biological materials. Uh, so long as we don't stress them too much. So, so long as we keep the displacements fairly small, um, then, then those principles are followed. Um, and uh, for us, anyway, bone is an obvious target for that kind of elastic modeling. It, it experiences a lot of stresses and strains every day. Um, and it has this very intricate uh, even delicate structure in certain places, um, so, but but to try and cope with that, uh, generally speaking, we, we use some sort of simplification to try and uh, solve our models when we've uh, assembled the finite element model. Uh, so using something like ANSYS or Abacus, we very hof often have to uh, adopt some kind of simplification. Uh, in which case, if you if you look at this. Uh, image on the right, you can actually see that there's quite a lot of directionality in some places um, which can get lost in simplification. Uh, another problem that occurs is that uh, a lot of bone really is, is distributed into the cortex, so most of it's actually on the edges. So if we homogenize our bone as it's termed, say over this little blue square, um, then we lose some of that directionality, and we also have problems where, where that little square or cube, as it is in our 3D models, gets near to the cortex where the bone is very dense. So the thing about voxel-based modeling is, is that it offers this kind of multi-scale approach. We can, we can work down at this very low detail if, if that suits us. Um, and here's a, another kind of illustration of what that kind of grows up into. Basically, we, that means that we have to use very many elements to try and model that, uh, those finer structures, if, if that's what we want. Uh, but how do we choose that kind of resolution? Uh, well, it's uh, a common metric is uh, to use trabecular thickness. Uh, which is defined as uh, the largest diameter sphere contained within a model at a given point. 
Um, but this varies from species to species. Um, and I'll give some, give some typical values here uh, for what that looks like from elephants and humans. But if, if with humans we're, we're trying to model a trabeculae uh, at 100 micrometers, that means that we have to have images uh, really at a, at a much finer resolution than that because uh, what we like to have is, is all of our structures to be at least five voxels thick. Some people in, in literature seem to think that three or four is okay, but that we would regard that as, as an absolute bare minimum. And, and we would like to really have uh, models with, with 10 voxels thick um, structures everywhere. Um, and so obviously for a human that would, that would get down to 10 micrometers resolution. Um, and a recent guide that somebody published to uh, micro CT, the way that this translates, and I hope that everybody can sort of see the, the detail in this image. Uh, for some rodent data, they, they, uh, they, they took the scans at various different uh, resolutions, and, uh, and you can see by the, by the right hand image that more or less uh, most of the detail is lost. Um, but even in the um, even in the first image, really, things are, are pretty uh, thin and, and they wouldn't satisfy this kind of five voxel thick requirement that we would like. And, and you can see in the second one, certainly, that, that, that even some of the thicker structures are broken. Uh, and that presents various problems for our models. Not only is it not going to be very accurate, but, but we're going to be introducing instabilities as well. Um, and, it, and it gets worse because uh, besides try to choose our resolution if we have any other problems like noise or, or any image processing that we want to do um, then we might lose resolution that way too um, so we, we really have to go for uh, as many elements as we can get for some problems um, well how did VoxFE develop we know that um, bone exists in a continual state of change it peaks in uh, in adult life, early adult life, and after 35 years, it starts to go down again. Uh, so that at 70 years of age, we know that more than 30% of the bone mass is lost, and that that bone mass and structural uh, morphology are very much affected by lack of exercise and other diseases. So, in a way, our starting point uh, was a, a PhD thesis done by George CCS uh, where he established a framework for the investigation of remodeling that is how that, that, that bone changes over periods of a fairly sh short time span uh, it took him months that uh, cells can change over and how those um, that remodeling can be affected by growth and disease and other stimuli uh, in 2009, in conjunction with uh, the Hull York Medical School, uh, AGUI was added uh, and the, the script file format was developed, which uh, allowed remodeling uh, and also allowed that to be used with uh, an external solver. Uh, the GUI allowed uh, the display of boundary conditions and, and strains from that solver output. And the whole scheme really was optimized for voxel data. But one thing they used, Ball and C Builder, which is a, a Windows rap, rapid application development tool, they call it, um, which in rep retrospect turned out to be an unfortunate choice because there was uh, no 64 bit version uh, until uh, sort of a year, 18 months ago. Uh, and that version turned out to be very different. Um, so, we were stuck really, we were limited with our 32-bit uh, code, which limited us to 20 million elements thereabouts, and, it, and even then it was a bit unstable. Uh, and we were relying on a, a graphics component developed by the, uh, the, the ball and user community, uh, which wouldn't uh, compile under the, the new 64-bit version. So we uh, arrived at a kind of sticking point. Uh, PowerView, on the other hand, is an open source cross-platform tool, as you may know, available in 32 or 64-bit uh, programs. 
uh, it it uses the uh, the VTK toolkit, um, which has a very standard display model now. It's been developed over a decade or more, uh, 15 years or something like that. It has uh, multiple views and many filters from VTK are, are now integrated into Paraview. And a very nice feature is the, the undo redo stack, which is particularly good for, for visualization problems because quite often you want to kind of backtrack and look at your data in different ways. Uh, you might contour and find out that it doesn't look so good, so so you simply go back uh, and try something else. And over the intervening years, really, the, the, the interface has become much better documented. There's many more tutorials and videos and things available, so it's much more accessible to uh, newcomers. Uh, this is what our plugin looks like in BoxFE. It, uh, it exists. I, I don't know if you can all see this pointer of mine, but um, uh, in the little green circle on the right, we've uh, introduced uh, six new buttons into the ordinary PowerView display. Um, I'll talk about those in a second, but uh, I'll just might mention the, a few features here. Uh, there is an example session that I, that I put up on, on YouTube of this model. And I put those links at the head of the chat display if anybody wants to, to go and run that from YouTube. Uh, we tried running it over the, this blackboard thing, but um, things didn't work out so great. So I'm just going to let, let all the people go off and, and use those links as they wish. Um, uh, and the links are, are at the end of these slides. Uh, but a couple of things to note is that are that uh, the pipeline browser is kind of where most things sort of happen in Paraview. Uh, our object here exists as, as a kind of VTK form here to which all the filters can be applied. So uh, I've imported some displacement data and we've computed some strains and color mapped them. And then these uh, separate plots on the right hand side are given as kind of 1D output of what that strain looks like in certain positions. And it's really what we've done is try to to take power, uh, take make use really of the of the power of, of Paraview. Once we've got our object in there, then then things become much more open to us. Uh, so I'll just run through a few things that that Paraview does offer us in in the next few slides. Um, well, our functions are to import and clean up the image data as we import it. We actually use ITK for that. Um, and we allow a, a group extraction in case we want to, to define bone across a, a, a range of elements. We might want to have different material types for, for the different thicknesses of bone, different types of bone. Uh, and we want to be able to group those into a, into an actual region which uh, can be separated and, and we can apply boundary conditions to that region and treat the bone group as a whole. Uh, so the other functions that we want are to be able to specify boundary conditions. We want to be able to look at what those boundary conditions uh, might look like to make sure we haven't done something uh, silly in setting up our model. And then we want to be able to export our boundary conditions uh, maybe with choosing particular ones to a constraint files towards our solver. Uh, and then once we've actually solved, we want to be able to import those displacement uh, uh, back into view strains and stresses. Uh, you'll see a question to, to paste the links again. Yeah, I can do that. Um, so that the tutorial. Copy is is this link, um, uh, and I'll paste some of the others again at, uh, at perhaps at a more appropriate time. Um, okay, so so looking at, at what VoxFE is giving us then, um, once we've done all this kind of uh, importing of data, uh, on the right hand side you can see a, a trabecular model. Uh, we've loaded it. Uh, across the top of this plate, uh, and we've restricted uh, 
the base so that it can't move uh, in this sort of horizontal plane, but it, it can kind of uh, stretch in certain positions. So at this point, say, it can't move this way, but it can move this way. And this point is allowed to move freely across this plane, uh, but not out of this sort of horizontal. Another great feature is the, the level of detail operator, uh, which automatically switches into this lower resolution representation uh, when you're trying to rotate your model around to try and inspect these um, conditions and to, to look at your model. Uh, and for large models, this is, this is really quite a crucial feature. Uh, the color mapping, as you've seen it already on some of the models, allows us to, to display strains uh, and inspect them. But uh, a common finding is that because the displacements are very small, uh, not to exceed this kind of elastic limit, um, you can quite often import something and not really be able to see anything. But Paraview has this uh, really nice interface that you can adjust these sliders and set the, the limits. Um, and you know, it may be that in here somewhere there's a red voxel that you can't see where the, the strain's quite high. But uh, by using the, the feature of the, um, the the map editor, then uh, you can actually choose particular sections of strain or, or, and print them out in, in a kind of spreadsheet format. Uh, another great tool is clipping, because once you've imported some strains and you've got the kind of representation you want, uh, a common thing is to really uh, want to know what's actually happening to the structures inside an object. So here being able to uh, apply two separate clips allows us to, to still see where we are and we can sort of see that inside our object here that, that, that the, the strains and the loads being applied here are affecting uh, this structure inside the back of this uh, poor dragonfly's head. Uh, another really nice feature is to be able to view the displacement field uh, in a magnified sort of way so that you can get a much stronger impression uh, of what you're looking at. Um, here I'm, I'm taking our characters. This is, this is more towards a, a sort of remodeling thing to try and understand what's happening with the remodeling. Um, but uh, I've overlaid what the strains look like and what the displacements look like. So you, you can see that really uh, where there's uh, a lot of flexing going on on the top of this um, object that the strains and the displacements are are, are, uh, are causing an, an extra degree of uh, strain even in here. Um, so in summary, uh, we now have a much more stable, capable GUI. Um, our models exist as standard VTK objects. Paraview itself uh, incorporates many BTK filters. It, it doesn't introduce them all, but via this kind of plug-in mechanism, you can add what you need or, or anything that you, you see is missing. Um, and a really nice feature is that it restricts the use of those filters to make sure that they're only used with the appropriate data. And it makes it very easy to choose the particular filter that you actually want for doing many common visualization. Uh, algorithms, contouring, clipping, and so on. Uh, multiple views, being able to, to uh, reduce the dimensionality uh, into 2D or 1D views to be able to look at the, the data in terms of spreadsheets. And even to, to go to kind of 4D with, with animations. It's a very, very powerful feature. We're now handling uh, 100 million elements on fairly modest desktop machines. Uh, we have found in the past, uh, last year, that we got uh, our plug-in building on Archer, but then due to the upgrade, things uh, sort of stopped working. But I understand now from our colleagues in EPCC, this is kind of hot off the press, that, uh, that they now have the new RSIP protocol working. I haven't had the, the chance to explore that myself, but hopefully we'll do very soon. Uh, as part of our Current grant, uh, we're hoping to extend things by uh, adding uh, muscle wrapping and uh, property definitions uh, and a lot more tutorials and examples to make it much more useful to the, the wider biomechanical community. Um, we're expecting to do a lot more modeling 
using a micro CT machine and, and a micro CT is, is, is very commonly available these days so many other departments we would hope would be able to, to take up and perhaps develop the plugin um, and we now have things like synchrotron data which uh, this is an original image from uh, a chap that's doing some work on, on dragonflies uh, and we're actually looking at the inside of a dragonfly's head here with, with individual muscles and things. I think this is terrifically exciting work to be going towards. Um, but I'll stop there for this first part of the uh, talk and hand over to my colleague in Edinburgh. Thanks Richard. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so um, Thanks for that, that was great. I'm going to now talk about my work uh, that I've been doing on the Vox FE2 solver with Ian Bethune at EPCC. Let's just see how long it takes to move this slide forward. Great. Um, so just briefly, I'll talk about what the solver does, what, it, what we want it to do. Then I will talk about the old solver, its strengths and its weaknesses, and why we decided to redesign the solver completely using the Petsy library. I'll uh, put up some preliminary performance results um, and then uh, discuss what the next step is for the solver. Okay, so okay, so what does the what do we want the solver to do? So as Richard was explaining, um, we have a bone model made up of voxels or elements um, that interact locally with each other, and we apply some force to the bone, and we'd like to know what uh, is the displacement of these elements after we've applied this force. And we can do that by iterative, iteratively solving a, linear, a system of linear equations um, represented by this matrix equation here. So what we see is A, the coefficient matrix, which contains basically all the information about the system, so your material properties and the interactions between the elements. And we have X the displacement vector, um, which is the vector that we'd like to know um, at the end of the iterative, iterative solutions, um, and the force vector, F, which contains all the forces and constraints in the system. And uh, it's, there are pretty standard algorithms out there to find the numerical solution of such systems. For example, contribute gradient method, another one would be uh, generalized minimal residual method. So that's all very well documented and that's a whole other field of research. But if you were writing your own solver, the thing you would be concerned with, perhaps, or one of the things you'd be concerned with the most, is um, the size of your coefficient matrix. Because this can get very big for very big models. And you'd be concerned about how to store it and how to manipulate it. However, for our models, the, the bone models that we deal with, um, what we find is actually A is quite sparse. Um, so there's something like for a 10 million element model, uh, which is quite massive, uh, only 0.003% of it is full of non-zero interesting entries. So the challenge would be then in figuring out ways to manipulate and store a pretty empty matrix. And this is actually what the old solver did, and it did a pretty decent job of this. Um, it had some very clever ways of finding a compact representation for A. So it's, a, it's, an op, it, it's an optimized parallel linear solver written pretty much in C++ and MPI. And it could model up to three materials. So why do we need several materials? Well, as Richard was explaining, um, or as he was showing with his uh, um, images, you have grayscale information in your CT scan, and, and so what that shows is that um, bone has varying density um, and therefore varying stiffness, and we want to be able to capture this detail, and, we, and, and the way to do that would be to have uh, a large number of, of different materials with varying stiffness and being able to model this. So the, the old solver could handle about three materials. Um, it could also, it also parallelized along the z-axis, so, um, that gave some speed up, and actually it was highly optimized to do this pretty well. Um, it could also handle about 20 million element models, I think just about, um, 
which is pretty decent. But for 20 million element model, uh, its scaling was pretty good up until about 256 cores where it would start to degrade and then it would struggle beyond that. So if we want to model, as Richard was explaining earlier, uh, complex geometries, realistic things, then really we need to do better than this. We, as I explained just now, we need more materials and we need the solver to be able to um, handle large models, much larger models, much more complex models. And if these models are going to get bigger, then we need um, better parallelization. So we want to be able to parallelize in all dimensions and we want the solver to perform well for a large number of cores. So we want better scaling so we can run these models in a reasonable amount of time. So as a developer, then you ask yourself, well, okay, what do I do? Do I build on the current code base or do I scrap everything and start again? And as I was saying that the old solver actually did a pretty pretty good job of running models of about 20 million elements, 10 to 20 million elements, um, up to about 256 cores. Um, but we decided that actually we should start from scratch. And there are, two, there are several reasons for that, but the sort of two most important ones, I'd say, is that, first of all, um, as you get with um, a lot of code that's been developed over the years by different people, um, it had just become very difficult to see a way through the code and to see how we could build on it um, and build on it sensibly. Um, but also, there exist uh, very powerful libraries that are continually being improved and developed uh, uh, that solves linear systems and have many different ways of solving them. And it would be good if we could utilize the power of these libraries. And so we decided to redesign the solver completely from scratch using, if I can get this slide to go forward, using Petsy. So some of you may know Petsy is, I believe it stands for something quite mouthy, portable extensible toolkit for scientific computation um, and it's a collection of data structures and routines um, for the scalable parallel solution of scientific applications so it um, is well maintained well supported lots of examples um, relatively straightforward to use and very powerful can solve all sorts of systems with a, a wide range of solution algorithms so what do we get with putting Petsy at the heart of the new solver design well, it has the potential to offer us um, the capability of running very large models. So we're talking about 100 million plus to hopefully billions of elements. Um, and it should allow us um, to run these models efficiently with good parallel scaling along all dimensions. Furthermore, it, as I was saying, it, there are lots of solution algorithms that Petsy is very specialized in running on massively parallel machines like Archer. Um, and therefore, the use of will have the choice of using lots of different solution algorithms to see which is best um, for whatever particular model they're running and, uh, and check solutions against different solvers, etc. And so that is a, uh, opening up a whole, whole uh, area of flexibility. Um, also, we can fine tune Petsy um, to improve the speed and scalability of our models. Um, and furthermore, and this is quite relevant for um, the work that Richard will describe in part three about remodeling, is that Petsy has a nice interface with Parmetis. And Parmetis is um, a graph partitioning, um, matrix partitioning software or library, as it were, developed by Caripus uh, Laboratories. And it will help with remodeling, but it also help, it will help with um, partitioning that big A matrix that I showed earlier um, efficiently across lots of cores. Um, furthermore, in the future, if we want to run on heterogeneous architectures with GPUs, then Petsy really is um, a nice library to use because it will allow us to do this quite, quite straightforwardly. So these are all very good reasons for putting Petsy at the heart of the new solver, and that's what we did. Um, and we simplified the interface um, to the solver, and so basically you just run your input scripts, tell the solver what model you'd like it to run, it'll do that, and it'll spit out the displacement vector, which you can then use 
um, however you want, and uh, use for remodeling, as Richard will explain later. So just want to show some preliminary performance results. So what we have here on the left-hand side, the big graph, is a graph of the scaling of the two solvers. Um, the blue dots show the new solver for Vox FE2, and the red dots show the old solver. Um, now, as you can see, the red so uh, the sorry, the old solver does actually do pretty well for this 10 million element model, which is not we're not really pushing the old solver too hard with the 10 million element model, um, so it's quite comfortable. And as you can see, it's done pretty well. So this model is actually um, a dense cylinder, and its length is along the z-axis, which is, if you will remember, the uh, only dimension in which the old solver is um, is partitioned. So it's it's doing pretty well, but our new solver does even well, even better. Um, it's super linear, um, and that's a little bit surprising. We were do, we were expecting, of course, for it to do very well, but perhaps um, at least it's, we have to understand uh, why it's doing so so well. It could be um, that uh, um, well, anyway, that's something to to, to think about. But um, on the right hand side, uh, you've got the raw times for solution. Um, again, you can see that not only does uh, the new solver, not only has it improved the scaling, so that as we increase the number of cores, um, the speed up increases, but the absolute times for solution have also improved. So the new solver is actually running faster as well um, compared to the old, old solver, which is encouraging. Um, so. These are very preliminary results, and we're, we're quite excited. Um, we will be testing the new solver against bigger models, 20 million elements, which is where the old solver struggles a bit. So that will be interesting to see what happens there. Uh, um, and that's basically where we're at with the with the new solver. So to summarize, uh, may, having made the decision to completely replace the old solver with a new PETSI-based design has meant that we have improved the scalability and the speed flexibility. We've also made it easy to extend the code further um, for future functionality. We've added multi-material capabilities, so now we can model uh, bone systems which require hundreds of different uh, materials with different differences. Um, and that's, that's great. The next step for developing the solver is to improve the parallel decomposition using Parmetis. And so what I mean by that is currently what we're doing is we're taking that big A matrix and we're basically just splitting it across the, the number, uh, across the total number of cores in a very simple manner. But if we find a better way to do this, if we find a better way to distribute the matrix across all the cores, then uh, we may further improve the, uh, the performance of the solver, which is um, what we'd like to do, of course. Um, Vox FE2 solver code will be up and available to all on Archer, um, and the code will be available and up on SourceForge uh, very soon. And uh, that's all I have to say. Any questions, I guess, feel free to ask them or we'll leave them towards the end. And I'll hand back to Richard, who will talk about remodeling. Thanks, Neilfer. Uh, <coughs> okay, um, so we want to do it. Uh, uh, illustrate that we could do some kind of remodeling process on Archer uh, in quite a, a basic form. Uh, so to, to just recap a little, we observed that earlier that the bone exists in a state of flux, uh, continual resorption and growth. Uh, it's actually quite fast as well. Um, but we also know that given age and other factors, disease and stress, uh, they can all have a, a big influence on that growth or resorption. But we're trying to, to show that we can we can actually implement something sensible and that the results look reasonable. So we, we're taking a fairly naive approach that we, we're just looking at the stress aspect, uh, loading rather, uh, to see if our models can adapt to that. Uh, we're, we're interested to know how we can move this forward on, on HPC. Okay, uh, so as Neela first just explained, we, we have the solver which exists as a kind of separate component. Uh, it builds on uh, uh, Ubuntu and on, on Archer we fairly easily. As I understand it, Petsy's not very Windows friendly. 
um, but maybe somebody out there knows better. I don't know. Uh, but we didn't want to really uh, change the, the solver to sort of bend it towards our own end. We, we decided that we, we'd rather leave it uh, to be its, be its own thing. Uh, what we realized we needed a, to do remodeling, we, we needed something that, that was capable of organizing the data and building a, a graph of, uh, of the elements so that we could compute our strains and then decide which uh, elements to delete and which elements to add on to. And we knew that we would need some, some form of glue code to uh, bring these two components together. So I hope that everybody can, can see this graphic reasonably well. Basically, we have these two two parts really of each other, the solver and the, and the remodeler. Um, and there are, there are kind of two types of input. We have the model with the constraints, boundary conditions, uh, and everything that defines that, uh, that has to be fed into both sides. Uh, but the remodeler itself needs to know about what these thresholds might be. Uh, this is a, a kind of lower quality uh, input, I suppose. But but really, what we'd like to do in future is is to develop this into to a much more dynamic choice of the upper and lower threshold. But but for now, it, it just has to be set up front. Uh, so this uh, input of the model is sent to the solver. Uh, eventually, it creates some displacements, and these are fed into our remodeler. And the same input files are fed into uh, some routines which, which create the graph uh, so that we know what the uh, connectivity is uh, of the elements. Uh, when those things are brought together, the remodeler then can find out which uh, voxels, uh, at the moment we just look at the surface voxels to decide which ones uh, of those they're going to change. We compute a property called strain energy density uh, which just sort of tries to calculate the, the total amount of elastic uh, energy that's been each element has been subjected to, uh, and then using our hard thresholds, we decide which voxels to add and which voxels to remove. Uh, there's an extra step here, which uh, then, uh, it, it, depending on the things that have been removed and added, uh, we we do a, a connect components check to remove. Uh, islands, as I think the, the bone community call them, so that, that these don't interfere with the, uh, the next model. Uh, ideally, we'd, we'd then pass that back to our graph structure, uh, and the solver and the thing would start again at the moment. It, uh, we, we take the easy approach of just rewriting all our models. Uh, but that does have the, the added bonus that we can go through our models uh, and all the data and, and strains and check, check what's going on. Um, for the remodeling component, then we actually uh, use Metis to to take. Uh, we can generate the, our node connectivity data. Uh, we use Metis to to turn that into element connectivity. Uh, as Mila for has mentioned, uh, we we want to make more use of Metis anyway, uh, and it's already available on Archer. Uh, but in fact, what it does is it creates a, a very compact and fixed graph. So I didn't want to use it directly. Uh, we created our own uh, graph component, making use of the fact that uh, a voxel can only ever have 26 neighbors, uh, which so that it, it can easily be represented as, as a sort of 32-bit integer. And that makes it reasonably easy to search through for surface voxels. and not too difficult to, to implement our, our connected components uh, algorithm, which is a kind of two-pass standard thing, really, uh, to, to create an initial labeling and then goes through and, and flattens that labeling into, uh, into the, the same numbering scheme. Uh, and then we just simply select the largest object that's present and, and remove everything else. Uh, so our glue code, um, uh, er everything is working on Archer in, in batch mode. Uh, we're reusing several components of our PowerView GUI plugin. The reader part, which creates the, the node connectivity file, which we feed into Metis. Uh, and we also reuse the strain calculation part, which, which takes the displacements from the solver uh, to compute our, our strain parameters. Uh, then the scripts, 
uh, we basically have a job submission script as as, a, as any job would do on Archer. Uh, this sets off a second script, which immediately sits waiting um, for the solver to to generate the displacements, um, and then it's able to do the remodeling as soon as the displacements are completed. Uh, currently. Uh, we just, as I said, we, we just create a new model file and start the whole process uh, and repeat over as many steps as we're allowed. Um, we've made it a little nicer than that in that if, if it ends on step three, we can start on step three again and just keep going uh, depending on how much time we've got. Um, one problem that we definitely have is, is, the, is the choice of thresholds. Um, because uh, these have to be sort of set up front. But uh, it does help us, again, that, that, that the PowerView GUI uh, has, has these nice features of extra views of the data and, and it has a really uh, nice uh, histogram feature that, so that if we import our strain data and, and look at the histogram, we can try and choose those levels, uh, at least initially. We suspect that, that optimally they would, they would need to be changed. Um, but this, as I say, is, is our first step. Uh, as an example, of what this kind of looks like then, we we thought of a, the simplest thing that we could do is set up a kind of Z model um, in which the top and bottom can't change, but they they they're fixed at the bottom and, and, uh, and loaded at the top. Uh, we thought that this would create um, higher strains in in the sharp angles, and that would uh, encourage our model to grow into a sort of I shape. Um, and it, it does actually kind of approach a kind of eye shape. I suspect that what we've got here is a, is, is a slight bit of flexing going on. I probably haven't made this top part stiff enough, um, although it seems to me that in real life it wouldn't be uh, that stiff anyway. So maybe this is one way that bone, bone does grow. So in actual fact, what, we, what we've got is a kind of tree structure where it's, it, I think it's resisting this kind of flexing along the top. Um, I have posted some more of these models on YouTube uh, to kind of look at the, the little video output, but for this next model, I thought I would just sort of flick through in the kind of old-fashioned way. We've loaded again at the top and, uh, and fixed it at the bottom. And uh, basically, I'm going to just flick through the next uh, few slides, so, so fix your eyes on the screen and just see how it grows. Okay. Okay, um, I hope everybody got the impression there. It, it, it seems to uh, grow away from this corner of the model. And I, I think you can see that uh, parts of this are now very, very thick indeed. Uh, I would think that this is, is because that there was a strong directionality in this bone sample in the first place, and, and it's kind of tended to build on, on where that, most of that load was being transmitted in the first place. So what can we do on HPC? That trabecula model was, was just a 2 million element model, um, which takes sort of between uh, 4 and 6 minutes, minutes to, to solve uh, with 16 cores. The, the remodeling is, itself is, is really very fast, so it's the solving part that, that is, is really quite critical. Um, and that is very similar to what I kind of get on, on my laptop, actually. But, um, the big advantage here is that being able to use Archer, we can investigate the choice of this, these thresholds. Obviously, we'd like to, to use more uh, processors with larger models. And uh, as Nilofer indicated, we, we've now got to that point where, where we, we want to be loading 50 million, 100 million element models and seeing what happens with, uh, with many, many hundreds of cores. But unfortunately, we're not quite there yet. So in future, apart from these larger models, um, we want to have uh, be able to, to to look at this kind of adaptive, a more uh, adaptive scheme because we, we suspect that these thresholds might change over time. We would like to be able to choose, say, five percent or something at the top and bottom end of, of the histogram, uh, and we'd also like to explore graph partitioning. This, this is an example of what 
uh, what Parmet is, or what Metis actually gives us uh, with a, a bone example. It's uh, it's dividing the sample up into, into quite uneven looking regions, which would be difficult to guess by uh, hand. Um, and the, the idea of Metis here is that it's minimizing the communication between the, the different regions, which is uh, the sort of optimal configuration for MPI. Uh, but it is the, the, exactly the kind of thing we would need to do for, for very large models. And it completely gets away from the, the old solver kind of technique of just slicing the thing up in, in kind of, um, you know, chunks across, which uh, for, it's, it's going to be very difficult anyway for, for, for complex models. Uh, okay, so this is my final slide. Those are the links. I've posted them in the, in the chat box. Uh, please go away and enjoy them. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Richard and Nina, for as well. Um, so the links um, that Richard has uh, put up here will also be put up on the Archer website. We'll also put the slides um, of the presentation, the both presentations up on the website, so this can be viewed afterwards. Um, so if there are any questions, are there any questions for, for either Richard or for Nina? For, please feel free to, to type in the chat window. Uh, or if you have a microphone, um, you can, you should be able to, to just speak as well. Okay. I'll take that as... Uh, well. <laughs> yes, no, it's, it's quite clear actually, and I think the, the detail in some of the um, the images was, was was definitely viewable, uh, so you can see as well. And um, yeah, it's very nice. Okay, so um, <laughs> Alex is approving. <laughs> More people are approving. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so thank, thank you both, and thanks everyone for attending uh, this Archer webinar. Um, uh, yes, that's the end of this session. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Richard.